Memorial, the Wilson Center, is the living memorial to our first internationalist president. Chartered by Congress in 1968, it is the United States' key nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues. Our goal here is to build a global brain trust, a network that generates actionable ideas and prepares the next generation of leaders for the policy challenges ahead. As many of you know, the Wilson Center recently, not so recently, joined forces with NPR to create a public event series which we call the National Conversation. Note that it, we call it the National Conversation, not the National Debate. We feel very strongly that people should have conversations around the tough issues. The quality of the debates, huh, the quality of the discussion during our last few NatCons has been truly spectacular. Our audience engaged with leaders like General Keith Alexander on cybersecurity, Graham Allison on the relevant lessons of the Cuban Missile Crisis on its 50th anniversary, and Henry Kissinger on China's once-in-a-decade leadership transition and its implications for the U.S. Today, I am very pleased uh, that we are hosting an event that tackles one of the most pressing issues the world faces, the international trade of illicit drugs. At the center, we have dealt with drug policy primarily in the context of our work on organized crime and growing insecurity in Latin America. And I'd like to recognize uh, Cindy Arnson, who's talking in the corner with the red jacket, who runs our vaunted Latin America program, and also Eric Olson, who is a star of our uh, highly regarded Mexico Institute. Uh, for example, in January 2013, Cindy Arnson and Eric Olson, uh, uh, along with Andrew Seeley, who was the head of our Mexico Institute, now heads is our vice president for programs, published a report that analyzed the causes for the marked spike in criminal activity in Mexico and Central America's northern uh, triangle while assessing the effectiveness of U.S. policy responses to date. This report included actionable recommendations to policymakers in the hopes of addressing the underlying problems that make these regions incubators for criminal organizations and extreme violence. The most recent worldwide threat assessment published uh, by the Director of National Intelligen Intelligence, Jim Clapper, labeled drug trafficking as a major transnational organized crime threat to the United States. In fact, South American drug traffickers and Middle Eastern militant groups like Hezbollah, and I would certainly add al-Qaeda, uh, and the Taliban, are becoming increasingly intertwined. It was reported yesterday that two Lebanese money exchange houses helped launder funds for drug traffickers. Illicit drugs cost tens of billions of dollars each year in destroyed lives, lost incomes, and economic opportunity, widespread violence and insecurity, and environmental damage. Illegal drugs also generate enormous profits that corrupt governments, undermine democracy, and fund violent, organized crime. These impacts are observed all over the world, from Atlanta to Afghanistan, from Argentina to Guinea and beyond. The international community, led by the U.S., has spent billions to stop the cultivation, processing, trafficking, and consumption of illegal drugs. These efforts have been sincere and determined, but the results are paltry. And having been to myself uh, as a member of Congress to Afghanistan many times, I cringe at the thought that the poppy trade is, is booming. Uh, the question is, what can be done that would be more effective? What kinds of reforms are needed to lessen the risks and threats posed by uh, illegal drugs? Simply pursuing a war on drugs uh, doesn't seem viable or cost-effective, given what's come before. Are prevention and treatment options viable alternatives? Is decriminalization or legalization an option? Well, a couple of states of the United States think so. Is there a middle ground between staying the course and legalization? Uh, our speaker, our keynote speaker, is a man I've known for some time, Gil uh, Kerlikowski, currently the director of drug control policy, a.k.a. the drug czar at the White House. Gill is the former chief of police of Seattle and knows firsthand the damage caused by illegal drugs. He also knows that the, quote, war on drugs, unquote, motif is outdated and inaccurate, and he has worked hard to promote reforms to drug policy that are more effective. As part of these innovative efforts, just yesterday, uh, what a coincidence in timing, the White House released the 2013 National Drug Control Strategy, which emphasizes less incarceration, and more diverse, diversion, treatment, and prevention. 
The strategy also calls for a renewed focus on reducing consumption in the U.S., which would weaken drug trafficking organizations in Latin America and reduce the violence they produce. Given the recent news, it's timely that today we are joined by a rock star panel of experts to help us explore the options and possibilities after um, um, uh, our drug czars uh, talk. Uh, Tom Jelton, who covers global security and economic issues for NPR, will introduce our other terrific panelists and and moderate the discussion. And no, I'm not going to call Tom Mr. Martha Raddatz. Not one more time. I will not call Tom Mr. Martha Raddatz. And I will salute him publicly for his astounding coverage and personal um, um, stamina uh, last Friday during the horror at Boston. If you tuned into NPR, you heard Tom Jelton. Um, It's now my pleasure. Uh, to introduce Gil uh, Kierlikowski, who was the, at the forefront of the issue. And I think, um, uh, I don't know whether I need to provide more background about Gil, but I think uh, we have enough and you're all familiar with him. And he will now make some keynote remarks. Uh, welcome to the Wilson Center, Gil. It's lovely to see you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you. A few years ago, I wouldn't have needed these, but... Now, well, listen, first of all, let me thank the Congresswoman, not only for the introduction, but also to her and the staff here at the Wilson Center. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, For my four years in this job in particular, uh, you know, I've followed very closely the writings, the analysis, the comments uh, that the staff has made uh, throughout the Western Hemisphere on these issues, not only around drug issues, but around safety and security. And it's also a great honor to be with uh, uh, with Tom and Scott and the ambassador uh, uh, later on on the panel, and I look forward very much to that. And as the Congresswoman mentioned yesterday, we did release the National Drug Control Strategy. Uh, I know you all have copies and you've read it thoroughly since it was out yesterday, but uh, uh, it's an important blueprint for the federal government because it's the president's strategy for how we should deal with our drug problems, how we should spend our money, where should our focus be, uh, what should we be doing. And it uh, actually has the force of law behind it in directing the federal government, but I think just as importantly, has a huge amount of influence, both nationally, uh, because so much of the drug issues are dealt with by our state and local governments, but also internationally, because we have a very... uh, uh, excellent group of people that have worked very hard uh, to put together what really is a comprehensive strategy. And it's important to provide some context about how this administration views drug policy, but also how we see drug policy reform. I was confirmed four years ago when the time has gone by just incredibly fast. The first week, I think, I did an interview and I said, look, this war on drugs issue is just a terrible analogy to use. It is just such such an inappropriate bumper sticker to what is such a difficult and complex problem. And it wouldn't really define the approach that the Obama administration uh, wished to take. Uh, I chose to banish the phrase, although it still continues to live on. Uh, We seek to reduce the drug use and the consequences of drug use, and that analogy, that war analogy, is just incredibly misleading. As a police chief, actually, I never used the the drug war analogy. And actually, I didn't ever hear many of my colleagues uh, uh, ever around the country. In fact, if I thought about one phrase that they often used, it was, we can't arrest our way out of this situation, meaning our drug (coughs) problems. And I say that as somebody that spent four decades in law enforcement. Well, unfortunately, today our nation is really involved in this counterproductive ideological debate over these extreme visions of drug policy in America. On the one side, those insisting that this outdated war on drugs, law enforcement-centric approach, building more prisons, more mandatory sentencing, arresting more users, uh, that's one side. Now, on the other side uh, are, are the groups selling legalization as a silver bullet solution to the drug problem promising to fill uh, state coffers with increased tax revenue and downplaying the impact on public health and public safety. And predominantly what we're talking about here with drug use is a public health problem. Truth is that neither of these extreme approaches, is it's not guided by experience, it's not guided by 
compassion. Uh, but most important, it's not guided by science. And the true nature of substance use and substance disorders really is guided by science and guided by medicine. So this administration decided to reform the path and move to a third way, one that very clearly balances public health, law enforcement, and international partnerships. And the third way is rooted in that drug addiction is a disease of the brain. Addiction can be prevented, can be treated, and people can recover. Decades of scientific research from the National Institutes of Health and others have demonstrated this time after time. And the strategy acknowledges that while law enforcement is always going to play a vital role in protecting communities and protecting families from drug-related crime and violence, the drug problem is more than just a law enforcement issue. And the strategy highlights the historic progress that has been made in achieving drug policy reform in these last four years. And the strategy begins with an emphasis quite clearly on prevention. We know that preventing drug use before it begins, particularly among young people, is the most effective way to reduce drug use and its consequences in America. And the research has concluded that every dollar invested in specific evidence-based substance use prevention programs in schools has the potential to save up to $18 in the costs that are related to substance use disorders later on. And that's why the 2013 strategy calls for national and community-based programs. For example, our drug-free community support program to prevent substance use in schools, on college campuses, and in the workplace. Strategy also points to an important public health role that the professionals play. Healthcare professionals have the opportunity to intervene in substance use disorder early, before it becomes chronic. Addiction is a progressive disease. Most people see their physician or their healthcare professional about once a year. So early detection and treatment of a substance use problem by a healthcare professional is an essential element in the public health approach to drug policy. That's why it's so important that we think about this also as part of primary care, not being some separate silo uh, away from the other public health concerns. The strategy emphasizes drug treatment because treatment works and it saves lives. And the Affordable Care Act, or ACA, provides for substance abuse and mental health benefits that will be included as part of the health insurance plans. And the fact that the President's 2014 budget requests an increase of $1.5 billion for treatment and prevention programs over the 2012 amount, that's the largest requested increase in two decades. The ACA is the most significant piece of drug policy reform in generations. By expanding insurance coverage, it extends uh, coverage for addiction treatment to millions of Americans who now can't afford it and don't get it. Treatment isn't, shouldn't be a privilege limited to those who can't afford it. It should be a service to everyone who needs it. And with this in mind, the strategy outlines steps to support implementation of the Affordable Care Act in providing treatment. And because of our renewed emphasis on prevention and treatment, the United States is also providing more than just military aid in support of our counter-drug efforts across the world. And during these last four years, as I have had that opportunity to travel the world on behalf of the, the administration, we often export and work together with other countries on a variety of treatment and prevention programs. Programs. Although too often the popular uh, myth is that, that we're only interested in securing that border to keep drugs out, we actually have some of the world's finest research in prevention and treatment. We also have some of the best research in building up community capacity because the work gets done at the local level no matter where you are on the globe. Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, they're known as CADCA, have funded, have been funded to do training and technical assistance uh, to community coalitions since 1992. And in the past seven years, the international interest in these kinds of programs at the local level has really surged. They now operate, in fact, in 16 countries and on three continents. We're providing international support for treatment also. In Afghanistan, for instance, where 90% of the world's opiates are grown, where drug consumption is a great threat to the future of the country and its people, the United States government directly supports 64 of the country's 82 drug treatment centers. And by partnering with foreign governments to invest in the health and future of the young people in these countries, we also lay the groundwork for increased international stability. 
Well, as you're all aware, we're engaged in confronting violent transnational criminal organizations. The drug legalization lobby often suggests that criminal operations would be significantly reduced or diminished if government would just legalize and regulate the sale of drugs like marijuana and cocaine. You know, I wish that solution to this complex problem, uh, this simple solution, was, was actually uh, uh, would work. But, of course, it won't work, just like any simple solution to a complex problem. And the research backs that up. In 2010, the RAND Corporation found that Mexican criminal organizations derive less than a quarter of their revenue from marijuana sales in the United States. And last year, distinguished journalist Alejandro Unco from Grupo Reforma made another compelling point, that dominating the cartels that established territorial control, uh, it turns out that most of the profit from what they do is engaged in selling protection, stealing from Pemex, uh, kidnapping, etc., extortion, piracy, prostitution. These are criminal organizations, and even if one part of their revenue stream is reduced uh, or cut off, there's no, uh, no belief on my part, having spent a, a good bit of time on this, there's no belief on my part that they're going to suddenly turn to some legitimate enterprise. The profitability of drugs is actually quite low compared to the profitability of many of their other activities. So the suggestion that legalization would reduce transnational organized crime is a fallacy. And it's a distraction from the hemispheric efforts to dismantle violent transnational criminal groups through strong government partnerships. And the government partnerships have really yielded some extraordinary results, especially in Colombia where decades-long effort between the United States and Colombian governments has freed Colombia from the grip of violent drug trafficking organizations. And as citizens of really what we are, an interconnected global community in human history, the biggest global community, interconnected global community in history, we know that it is so important to support peace and stability across the world. And that's why this government is so committed to international partnerships that reduce both the demand and the supply of illicit drugs. Well, that's the big picture. But as I mentioned before, our drug policy is based on the knowledge that addiction is a disease and it can be prevented in treatment and treated and people can recover. It's based on policies designed to support the health and well-being of people. It's premised on a pledge that government will support evidence-based solutions to substance use disorders that work. And it's a drug policy that's one that is global and it addresses really a spirit of, of shared responsibility. There's no silver bullet solution to these drug issues within the United States or anywhere else in the world. And the problem is complex and it requires a sophisticated solution. And yet the administration has confidence that a balanced strategic approach to the drug problem, one that emphasizes public health and effective international law enforcement cooperation is one that will work. And we're not working in a vacuum. At an international summit on drug policy that I attended last June in Peru, I made many of these same points. I encountered near unanimous support for this balanced approach. And at that summit, representatives from more than 60 countries were clearly uh, on board with these ideas. With the level of international consensus, I'm confident we're going to continue to build and strengthen partnerships domestically and abroad to reduce both drug use and the consequences. And I thank the uh, Wilson Center for hosting me, and I look forward to this panel. Thank you all. I'm Tom Jelton, and it's uh, on behalf of NPR. Uh, it's my pleasure to be moderating uh, one more of these terrific national conversations. They've been hugely successful. It's a great collaboration between NPR and the Wilson Center, and thank you, Congresswoman Harmon, for promoting it. Um, we do have a distinguished, uh, you've, you've already met uh, Mr. Kurlikowski, uh, and then we have Ambassador Carlos Pita from Uruguay, and Ambassador Pita has a distinguished career not only in his country's foreign service, but also in collaborating with the United States on drug enforcement uh, policies. 
Uh, he was instrumental most recently and most importantly, I would say, in reestablishing the Drug Enforcement Administration's presence uh, in Uruguay. And before that, he was active in the Uruguayan uh, Congress uh, and was president of the Committee on International Affairs, uh, where he had been a member for 14 years. Uh, Daniel Mejia uh, is director of the Research Center on Drugs and Security at the University of the Andes, which is a very prestigious university in Bogota in Colombia, and also president of the Government of Colombia's Advisory Commission on Drug Policy. So Daniel is a real expert on the way the Colombia government has addressed uh, drug, uh, drug trafficking. And as uh, Director Kurlikowski said, Colombia has been a real success story in recent years. Uh, I remember my, my first uh, foreign assignment as a as Latin America correspondent was uh, in in uh, Colombia in 1987. It was a time when many of us were really pessimistic about the future of Colombia. Uh, it appeared it was on the verge of becoming a narco state, and so Colombia is a real success story. And Scott Wilson, a uh, distinguished uh, former foreign correspondent for the Washington Post, a former assistant managing editor for Foreign News, and now a chief White House correspondent for the Washington Post. And, and one of the interesting things about Scott that makes your presence here today important, Scott, is that you were most recently at the uh, Summit of the Americas <coughs> conference. Was it Summit of the Americas in Cartagena? Right. Uh, when uh, hemispheric drug policy was, of course, a big issue. So. Uh, again, a really terrific uh, panel. I do want to begin, Director Kurlikowski, with one domestic political question, and I think it's important, and then we'll get it out of the way, but I think it's probably on <laughs> a lot of our minds uh, right now. You I wonder, mentioned... I wonder what it... <laughs> I wonder, you, you, can, you probably have the answer already. 1.5 billion, you're requesting 1.5 billion increase over 2012 for drug treatment. And you also referenced this ideological debate between the law enforcement folks and the, and the other folks. And there is a clearly a lobby for uh, a hardcore enforcement approach. How hard is it going to be to get the money shifted, resources shifted from that enforcement approach to a drug treatment approach in this environment of sequestration? I, I think the uh, important part uh, about all of this is that uh, when we uh, first talked about saying, look, this war on drugs analogy is just so inappropriate, uh, people warned me and said, oh, you should be very concerned because it's the third rail. It, uh, you will be uh, charged with uh, being soft on drugs or, heaven forbid, soft on crime. It's a little hard with four decades of law enforcement experience to, be either, uh, to have either of those charges. And uh, we, uh, one of the enterprising reporters uh, said, well, you know, that's maybe what he says, but I'm not sure that's actually true. So he called uh, six uh, police chiefs around the country and all said, no, it's not a war on drugs and we really need to invest more in treatment. Once you have that kind of support from uh, prosecutors, police chiefs, sheriffs, uh, and, and others, and the fact that even our most conservative governors throughout the country uh, uh, are reducing their incarceration rate, we know that uh, we, can, uh, we can still keep communities safe, we can give drug treatment, and we can do it for less money than keeping people locked up. And so it seems like a very common sense answer uh, to, to that part of the problem. So we'll push hard for it. Common sense answers uh, <laughs> maybe common sense, but doesn't mean we always get <laughs> funded, does it? <laughs> we'll see about yes. that. Um, my question is whether the factors that he describes in Uruguay, in that, in that sense, are, can be seen throughout Latin America, or does each country, in your view, in Latin America sort of have its own unique problems in confronting the drug problem? First of all, I think that the problem is divided in Latin America. I think in the South Cone you have uh, most of the problem is drug consumption, not production and trafficking. And in the North, in Peru, Bolivia, Bolivia is in the middle, but in Peru, Bolivia, and all Central America and Mexico, although drug consumption has been rising, the main problem still is uh, drug production, trafficking, and most importantly, violence. And this is, I think, the main factor that led former presidents of Latin America, like uh, Cesar Gaviria, Fernando Cardoso, and, and, and Ernesto Cedillo to, to <coughs> run the Latin American Commission on Drugs and, and Democracy. But uh, during the last year, we've seen many acting presidents, many sitting presidents, 
asking for an urgent debate on what works, what doesn't, and at what cost in terms of drug policy for the Latin American countries. And I think most of the, most of the debate uh, uh, is explained by the fact that uh, Latin American countries cannot continue paying the cost of a, of a policy that has failed. I mean, I, I don't think that uh, the 50,000 homicides in Mexico recently or the 420 homicides for 100,000 individuals in Colombia, in Medellin, in the, in the peak of the war against Pablo Escobar, justifies anything. And I think the call, it's an urgent, a, a, a respectful, but, a, but an urgent call to the US and to Europe to hold a debate about Latin American countries continue paying the cost of the, of the war on drugs. Of course, C Colombia has received $600 million per year during the last 10 years for Plan Colombia. Plan Colombia has been extremely successful in reducing violence, no question about that. But in terms of reducing the supply of drugs, I think the results are not so good. Uh, Colombia has been recently successful after 2008 when we stopped, not, not stopped, but diminished the, the, the amount of aerial spraying of coca crops and put more emphasis on, on interdiction. Uh, there was a large reduction in supply in Colombia, but at the regional level, coca crops went back to Peru and Bolivia. Uh, the labs that are used to process coca leaf into cocaine moved to Venezuela and to Ecuador, where actually they find gasoline, where gasoline is less expensive and the basis of operation of drug cartels moved to Central America and Mexico. So at the regional level, we haven't done much. And I think it's time to evaluate what has been reached, at what cost, and I think that the, the, the debate that President Santos is calling for, President Calderón, the former president of Mexico, called for, Guatemala, many, many Central American countries, is a respectful but urgent call to see if we can find more effective policies that are less costly to Latin American countries. And I think this is fair. I think Mexico cannot continue putting the, uh, the homicides so that less drugs reach the US and Canada and Europe. So we need to have a debate, an open debate, based on evidence, detached from ideological uh, positions or religious positions, and evaluate the evidence in the same way that I, I, do, I do fully agree with, with Director Kerlikowski that there is a lot of evidence, a, a lot of research evidence in the U.S. about what works in treatment, what, what works in prevention. But we cannot ignore that in Latin America we have produced a lot of evidence about what works in reducing supply. What amount, what, to what extent uh, drug policies le lead to more violence. And, and I think we should take into account the other part of the, of the, of the market, which is the supply part of the market, mm -hmm. and try to, to find uh, more effective policies to confront a problem that is going to be with us forever. I mean, it's a myth that we're going to cut to zero the, the demand for drugs. But we, we need to find more, more effective policies, not only for the US and Europe, but for Latin America as well. And, and briefly, do you think that this new drug policy, which has just come out yesterday, is how important a step is it in the direction of, of promoting that very debate that you say is so urgently needed? I think it's a good initial step. Uh, personally, I'd, I would like to, to, to have seen a more aggressive change in the, in the policies. Uh, I do agree with, uh, with less enforcement and more treatment and prevention, but in Colombia, in Mexico, we need to see less spraying and more development, mm -hmm. less repression and more focus on reducing violence. And I would ha have liked to see more of that in the, in, the, in the document that was presented yesterday. Thank you. Uh, Scott, I, I have a couple of questions for you that probably should go to Dec Director Gerlikowski, but knowing he's on a hot seat, it might be easier for you to deal with him than, than him. <laughs> <I'll> try. <laughs> uh, the big issue domestically, politically, has been marijuana. Uh, I read the other day that now, talking about um, how many, you know, 20 states or something like that are now sort of moving in that direction. How big a problem does, is that, from your point of view as a White House correspondent, how big a problem is that for this administration in terms, and I'll let Director Kralikowski talk about it as well, but to what extent does that sort of overshadow, the, you know, the need to sort of come up with a policy, how to deal with these states like uh, Washington and California that are legalizing marijuana, you know, when, when there are still federal crimes uh, against it? 
How is the administration dealing with that? It's uh, awkwardly at the moment. They're, they're not quite sure what to do, I think, in, in terms of, of, of going after some of those referenda. The Justice Department examined some of these things, but after they were passed, we all asked right away, what are you going to do about these, this movement to legalize? And uh, it was unclear at that point uh, what to do. And, and uh, Director Kolakowski can speak better to this, but, but from a, a perspective of being in Cartagena, for example, um, you have uh, the problem with U.S. drug policy in Latin America writ large has, has long been a sense of hypocrisy from their point of view. Uh, Director Kolakowski's comments, though, you know, with the emphasis they're placing on, on consumption <coughs> Uh, demand in the United States really flips from 10 years ago what the emphasis would have been. The, the proportion that he spent talking about treatment uh, compared to eradication uh, was, was basically the opposite uh, when I was working in Colombia 2000-2004. Um, but with states, so there still though is a difference between what they're hearing from the United States and what they're seeing in the United States. Addressing treatment, uh, consumption is, is one step, but while the United States may express some angst over President Mujica's move in the marijuana market, they're seeing, they keep hearing eradicate, uh, this won't work, uh, and yet you have states legalizing marijuana. It, it's, not, it's not coherent to them, and it's harder to build political consensus uh, around some of those, uh, against some of those ideas, the experimenting that Uruguay is doing. Um, some of the issues raised by President Calderon and, and President uh, uh, Perez Molina, the first two sitting presidents at the time to really call for a serious discussion about uh, legalization. Um, and like Director Kolakowski, who has great credibility with law enforcement, these were two not soft on drugs people. These were, these were you know, more right than left, certainly on that issue, uh, and began to raise these issues running up to the Cartagena summit, uh, largely because they, they took office. Uh, Calderon had been in office five years by the time he spoke at the UN to talk about moral obligations and uh, to cut consumption, that the problem was much bigger than they realized. Um, and uh, I think they're still trying to, to figure out what exactly the United, what, what direction the United States is going to take domestically uh, uh, before it really uh, begins to tell uh, publics that, that, uh, that legalization isn't a good idea. Well, Director, a couple of points here that I'm sure you're anxious to respond to. One is uh, Ambassador Pita's uh, explanation of uh, his government's uh, reasoning in doing this experimentation in the marijuana market and also, as Scott says, uh, the, how do you present a coherent and rational explanation of your policy to your neighbors when there seems to be kind of a disjointed approach being I mean, taken here in this country between states and the feds? I think the ambassador's explanation is, is really quite helpful and quite useful. Uh, uh, and, and, I, and I certainly understand looking at the problem of cocaine paste because we had gone through the crack cocaine issues just as Brazil is going through that uh, significantly now. But I, I think the point that I would make that I would push back on with the ambassador is about the, the regulation, that you'll be able to actually regulate the market. And our experience in the United States, and believe me, every country is certainly free to make those choices and those decisions that, that they do. But our experience in attempting to regulate the use of alcohol or to regulate the use of tobacco, I don't think anybody sees as particularly <coughs> successful. We're not able to keep one of the most controlled substances in our country out of the hands of children, and that is our very powerful prescription painkillers. Those are highly regulated, highly taxed, highly controlled from market uh, uh, to consumer, and yet uh, we have over 16,000 deaths just from the painkillers uh, alone. So the regulation issue is, uh, is, is a very difficult one. I think on Scott's points, uh, he's, he's very much right. One of the great difficulties I have uh, in explaining to my counterparts, particularly in the Western Hemisphere, is our federation. And the fact that we have a certain number of states uh, that are able to put propositions or initiatives in front of the voters. And at one time, those initiatives had to be based upon a number of signatures that could only be gathered voluntarily. Uh, 
But once that restriction was lifted and you could pay for people to gather the signatures, during my nine years in Washington State, I saw a rather large number of bizarre initiatives that would actually uh, be in front of the voters. And when you receive a voter, a voter pamphlet to explain things to you, and it's over 100 pages long, uh, you know, I'm not so sure every voter goes into the, into, into the level of detail. All of that uh, on, the, on the Justice Department's positions are questions that the Department of Justice, of course, will, will, uh, will answer. But on the public health approach, we think that this middle ground uh, of moving toward a much better approach to education and public health uh, will, be, will be helpful. Legalization uh, is, is not a, a, a good answer to a public health problem. Um, you've made that point persuasively, but you're not, I, do, you wanna, do you want to offer a kind of a personal view on this issue of whether the, United, the, the federal government should stand in the way of states that want to sort of? No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't figure, I had to oh, figure good, it. But it was very well done. <laughs> <laughs> that counts for something. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, Ambassador Pita, um, Director Kurlikowski, in his initial comments, pointed out that this idea that you can sort of weaken organized crime groups by legalizing marijuana is based on the idea that marijuana trafficking is important to those groups. Um, you made that same linkage in your, in your remarks, that, you're, that there is one of the reasons that your government is going down this path is in order to weaken these organized crime groups. What about this idea that that may not be a fruitful way to go. Sí, lo, lo primero que quiero decir es que sobre esto es muy difícil que the thing I'd like to say en donde haya cuatro personas is cuatro that it's very difficult if you have four people seated talking about these issues, it's very difficult for all four to reach agreement. It's practically impossible. Second, in Uruguay, the main substance consumed is alcohol, followed by tobacco, then psychopharmaceutical products or psychoactive pharmaceutical products. They're all treated or regulated differently. Some are repressed, and the others are relatively regulated. Marijuana is the main illegal substance that is consumed. And the experience is that there has been a sustained, gradual increase in consumption in recent years. We look at household surveys, and marijuana, as reflected in a household survey, gives you reliable data. We are fearful that this issue could become contaminated with cocaine paste. I think that everybody who is here is a specialist. But there's a world of difference between cocaine paste, and you don't have this problem. Here you don't have it. Cocaine paste is made with residuals or residues of cocaine. It's diluted with kerosene, a petroleum byproduct, and other organic solvents. And it has a brutally addictive effect, which has multiple uh, killing of neutrons, of neurons. Uh, each time you consume it, it kills a large number of neurons, a much larger number the second time, and so forth, all very quickly, after a very short time. The issue in Paraguay, we say that there's about 1.1% prevalence. In Argentina, it's much greater. Brazil has a very serious problem. So it's a very different situation. We have practically no problem with cocaine because it's a drug that does not provoke serious public health problems, and the percentage of consumption is not very great. What we need to do is focus on the problem that we have. Now, how do I know that regulation doesn't work? For the substance, well, it's not of any use for me to make a comparison with tobacco. We repressed it very harshly. We are perhaps the country that has most harshly repressed tobacco, and we've had great success in reducing consumption. 
We tested it out and it worked out. It might not have worked out, but it did. And there's a certain worldwide consensus that repressing tobacco is a way to diminish tobacco consumption. And so, so much so, there's a multi-million dollar lawsuit against uh, by Philip Morris against Uruguay for adopting these public policies. Alcohol situations like here. And consumption is more or less the same. Now, what we're looking at is marijuana and not wanting it to become contaminated by cocaine paste. First, because the people, by, uh, people who, uh, who consume marijuana, just uh, marijuana of quality, with the, who are on record with the Ministry of Public Health as being users, and this is not for some kind of tourism. Uh, uh, type experience, moving away from other experiences, and we're consulting this because it's, a, it's something that we're talking about because there's not a consensus. As I say, it's very difficult to talk about drugs in general and uh, regulation and legalization and reach consensus. There is no such consensus. Each substance is different. Alcohol has nothing to do with cigarettes, with marijuana, with cocaine paste, with cocaine. We practically don't have synthetic drugs, but with amphetamines, it's all different. Each drug requires a particular analysis. That is the discrepancy that I have with Mr. Kurlikowski. It's impossible to say that in one it worked, in the other it didn't, and here it's not the case either. We just don't know. Se me hace que quizás sea útil para el público. Ambassador Pizza says, you guys don't know uh, how serious a problem this smoking, this cocaine paste is. Uh, Director Kurlikowski, you did compare it to, to crack. Could, maybe you could just give a sort of a quick uh, explanation of, the, of what, is, what is the ambassador talking about when he talks about cocaine paste and how is it different from crack cocaine? As I understand what the ambassador is saying is that the cutting agents that, uh, the, that are used to make the uh, cocaine paste, which is very powerful and, and goes to the brain very, very quickly through the inhalation uh, with the marijuana. And we've seen that with the PCP here mm -hmm. also, uh, uh, laced marijuana, uh, is that the cutting agents are so incredibly powerful and, uh, and cause uh, so much of the, the uh, neurological damage. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned uh, some of the more common and more available cutting agents like kerosene, mm -hmm. right, and that, but and and that's more potent even than smoking crack cocaine. You, you know, I actually wouldn't. I, I couldn't tell you the difference, but I certainly agree with the ambassador on the on the damage. Okay, uh, moving on, uh, Daniel. Uh, it um, caught my attention that uh, you, even speaking from a Colombian point of view, think it's important to sort of keep a focus on the supply side. Because uh, we used to hear in Columbia, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago when I was there, and probably Scott as well, you know, there seemed to be much more of a focus uh, in many of those countries that it's all, it's, it's demand, it's demand, it's demand. Is there sort of new thinking now in, in your country and in some of the other countries that maybe it is time to really focus on the supply side? Well, my, my point is that although consumption has been increasing in, in all Latin American countries. My point is that the main problem is still for, for, for most of the countries in the region, especially in the, no in the north part of South America or in Central America, is the illegal <coughs> armed groups that are linked to drug trafficking. That's, mm -hmm. that's my point. It's not that I'm pushing for more supply reduction efforts. On the contrary, I think, I think we should think of, of, of wiser ways of, of confronting supply instead of focusing only on supply because it's the market trends associated with this illegal market what creates the, he the large amounts of violence that we see in Latin America. Look, producing one gram of pure cocaine in, in the jungle of Colombia costs $2.5. That gram, that's $2,500,000 uh, per kilogram. Uh, that, that kilogram in the Pacific of Colombia, once it leaves the, the labs, costs anything between four and five thousand dollars. When it reaches Mexico, it costs between ten and fifteen thousand dollars. When it crosses the border, it's thirty-five thousand dollars. And in the streets in the U.S. costs anything between one hundred and fifty thousand dollars and two hundred thousand dollars. So it's the market trends, the large market trends associated with illegal drug trafficking what makes this group fight as hard as they can to control the business. 
to kill policemen, to kill each other, to corrupt the system, etc. So I think the best contribution that the U.S. can do to, to Latin America is to reduce the demand for drugs. Why is this so? Because it would reduce the size of the market. It would shrink the, the profits uh, in, this, in this illegal business. And basically, it would reduce the amount of funding that these groups get to create <coughs> violence. And that's why I think most Latin American countries also push for ways to not only reduce the demand, in, in demand for drugs in, in, U, in the US, in Europe, etc., but also we, keep, we have to keep fighting not, not necessarily illegal drug trafficking, but the violence associated with illegal drug trafficking. Uh, as long as drugs remain illegal, there is going to be violence, and we have to stop violence. And that's, that's what I think most of, of us in Latin America have been focusing on. Uh, to what extent are the coca growers? Uh, I know the coca growers were sort of an important base of support for Evo Morales in, in Bolivia. What about more broadly? Are the coca growers a, a, a political force in your region? Not in Colombia. Not in no, Colombia. not in Colombia. Mm -hmm. not, not in Colombia. In the region, in Bolivia, is, is a different situation. In Colombia, is not a big political force. Uh, and they don't get rich out of this, out of cultivating coca. They actually get less than the minimum wage out of cultivating coca. The real uh, guys making profits on these industries are the traffickers, not even the producers. I mean, $2,500 for a kilogram of cocaine is not that much. Actually, we've done the calculations, and in Colombia, the amount of resources that enter Colombia, uh, the Colombian economy out of the drug, cocaine production and trafficking business is around $8 billion. That's 2.5% of GDP. That's the largest industry in Colombia. But although it seems like a small number, it's 2.5% of GDP concentrated in the hands of illegal armed groups, creates a lot of damage to the, to the countries. Scott, you were in Colombia. Uh, you were, you were, when you were Latin America, covering Latin America for the Post, were you actually based in Colombia? I was based in Bogota. Yes. In Bogota, from 2002 to 2004. 2000 to 2004. So the first two years of President Pastrana, the last two of uh, uh, President Uribe. Right. And you were back for the Cartagena summit last year. Have you sort of stayed with, with this, uh, you know, kept an eye on the story? And I'm curious what trends you've seen over the last 15 years. Yeah. A, a bit. Not as much as I w would have liked, but I still have a lot of friends there and have traveled back several times. Um, and, and, and I would say to, to 1987, even, even as, as recently as 2000, 2001, it, a lot of us feared for Colombia's future. There were 18,000 members of the FARC under arms, 15 to 25,000 paramilitary groups fighting for the trafficking routes, fighting for control of the coca fields in the south in particular. Uh, and it, uh, right up around Bogota, the FARC was very close. Um, it was a very, uh, the, and, and had their, their uh, uh, cleared area in the south where peace talks were taking place that, that did not result in anything. So it, it was a very sort of dire situation when I was first there. Um, and the uh, w one thing that struck me and, and that I was reminded of in, with Director Kurlikowski's remarks was the United States does see its drug policy as supporting uh, peace and stability, I think is your words, and I, I, I believe that. That there is a difference, though, in there's a, a disparity between our interests uh, in, and and obviously the govern Colombian government's interests to take Colombia in particular. Stability is upset by eradication, um, and uh, there was uh, uh, particularly when I was there, there were large industrial size coca farms in the south, in particular, uh, which were which were fairly easy to spray. Uh, that was impoverishing to a lot of the local coca growers and caused a great deal of unrest, who, as Danielle said, they were growing largely at the behest, at, at, the, at gunpoint, uh, by, the, by the FARC or the paramilitaries, depending on who controlled regions. Um, and it was also more lucrative, I, I won't dispute that, than the yucca and rice and other things that they were trying to grow. Um, my understanding, though, is that, it, and it happened even while I was there, those large farms broke into small ones. Uh, it became extremely hard to hit those plots with spray, and so you started spraying food crops more and more, and you got real ferment 
uh, which helped the insurgencies, which helped the paramilitaries, and which upset Colombian stability and spiked violence quite a bit. Um, those are the stills, I think, some of the conflicts that take place and some of the challenges that, that Danielle highlighted and that, that the director highlighted. Um, uh, and, and yet, there has been, a, a, you know, as Danielle traced the, the profits, uh, I believe that the armed groups there, paramilitaries, have been demobilized and broken into de facto drug gangs, I suppose, even if, if they were largely that when I was there. Um, but they don't have as much money. And I, and I suppose that is one reason, not only Plan Columbia, the military training component of Plan Columbia, really taking grip and taking hold and becoming a much more professional army and anti-guerrilla force, but also fewer profits for the FARC, which even when I were, was, was there, was increasingly dependent on an assortment of fronts that it had in the drug-producing areas and were, were largely uh, drug trafficking operations. Director Kurlikowski, Scott's comments sort of underscore what is a reality uh, in terms of policy challenges in this country in a wide variety of areas, and that is that sometimes policy goals in different sectors of government policy can conceivably come into conflict. He mentioned how a focus on eradication can sort of uh, jeopardize the social and political stability and economic stability in, in a country. Uh, classic interagency question for you, how do you in this administration, and you in the Office of uh, Drug Control Policy, how do you deal with these p potentially conflicting policy goals? Well, I, I think that, and I, and I agree very much with what uh, Scott has said, that uh, the perception for quite a while has been that you're interested in providing us with uh, uh, spray and planes and paraquat and, uh, and information for one reason, and that is to keep the drugs out of the United States, to keep them away from our children. And in turn, uh, uh, we would come back with uh, uh, the discussion that it's much more important now in these last four years in particular for us to be able to talk about this issue as not just a shared responsibility for us to reduce our consumption, because our consumption of cocaine, for example, is down by about 40 percent, and that's only in the last six or so years. So we actually think we've made great progress in this country on cocaine uh, uh, consumption reduction, and that's by every measure, and we have a number of measures. But it's also important that the United States, because about 85 to 90 percent of the drug treatment uh, research in the world is conducted or paid for uh, through NIH, is that we also be able to export to these other countries uh, the important things that we have learned from treatment and the important things that we have learned from prevention. And I'd mentioned that our methamphetamine consumption as a country uh, is, is down a great deal. So I think it's important for people to, to recognize that this shared responsibility, which I think both formerly Secretary uh, Clinton, uh, the President, have, have really admitted we have to do more, and that's what his policy is doing to reduce our own consumption. But we also have to do more to be able to help because every country that I have visited, and now I have visited a number of countries, there is no one immune from a drug consumption problem, uh, whether it was in Guatemala City, or in, uh, in uh, other countries. And so really, we're kind of all in this boat together. Okay. Uh, we, need to, we need to wrap up uh, here so that we can get out of here on time. There is a tradition here at the Wilson Center uh, where we each, uh, with the exception of the moderator, who doesn't like to put himself on the spot, uh, sort of sum up sort of one point that you want to take away, either a message that you want to underscore or something maybe that you learned from your fellow panelists. Uh, sort of sum it up in one, one brief message, We're beginning with you, Director Kurokowski. Well, first of all, I learn something from uh, the panelists every time I meet with them, and, uh, and, it's a, and, and it's a real pleasure for us to be able to have these exchanges and, and further exchanges. Uh, I would sum up that this uh, President's drug policy is the most dramatic shift toward public health. Uh, that I think generations uh, uh, from now will be very pleased with and will make a significant difference in not only the problems that drugs cause in our country, uh, but hopefully will be of greater help and greater assistance to our, our uh, partners throughout the world. Ambassador. 
I would fundamentally underscore I would fundamentally underscore our agreements on a public health approach on the importance of education and fundamentally uh, the unit the, the uh, unity of values that are t transmitted when we talk about fighting consumption trying to have an integral message that doesn't uh, end up disauthorizing us when we make these statements Daniel gracias creo que el mensaje principal all agree with is that we have to give a debate based on, on evidence and not on ideological positions. And up to recently, the debate was purely an ideological debate. And the evidence shows more and more that the current prohibitionist regime hasn't worked. And we have to find alternatives. And I think no one is asking for full legalization. To, no one is asking for drugs to be sold in, in, in the schools, nothing like that. Regulation doesn't mean being soft on crime. Quite the opposite. Regulation means concentrating police resources on criminals, <coughs> not on drug users. And I think this is what uh, everyone is looking for. And I, uh, finally, I, 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 I want to thank uh, Director Kerlikowski for opening to this debate. I think this is the first time, and we've, I, I know many people in the audience who has been in, we've been doing a lot of debates in Latin America, in different countries, but uh, almost in no in, in none of the, the debates in the past, U.S. government officials have participated. So I, I, I'm happy to to have this debate with the with the U.S. officials because this is important to have a respectful debate, but uh, uh, based on evidence, basically. Good. It, Scott, we'll just following a bit on on Danielle's, I mean, I, I do think that 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 the the policy parameters that the director has outlined does put the United States much closer to, to the Latin American consensus on this issue. Uh, that, it, that it is uh, the emphasis on, uh, on the domestic American issue of this is, is important. Uh, while also saying the problem uh, is becoming more complicated to some degree uh, because of Latin America in some ways being a victim of its own economic success. Um, the reason Uruguay has has problems, even though that that the, what they're going after affects the poorest of the poor, uh, and Brazil and Argentina is a rising middle class that is that is becoming a drug consuming class, um, and and that that does echo the administration's message of shared responsibility uh, with evidence uh, that didn't exist, say, 10, 15 years ago. Those sorts that that kind of rhetoric did not ring true nearly to the degree that it does now in Latin America. So it's a step in the right direction, but it's also a, a problem that is becoming more complicated. Indeed. All right, well, I'd like to thank our panelists, Scott Wilson, Chief White House Correspondent for the Washington Post, Daniel Mejia from the Universidad de los Andes, uh, Ambassador Carlos Pita from the Republic of Uruguay, and Gil Kerlikowski, Director of the Office of National Drug Policy at the White House. And uh, thanks to the Wilson Center and thanks to my organization, NPR. I think these are terrific national conversations. And thanks to all of you for, for coming today. <laughs>